Hello, sunshine. I'm Alexi Lawless, and welcome to the State of the Union podcast, where we look at the beautiful game on and off the field through the lens of red, white, and blue colored glasses. Uh, this week, we will be talking the continued Bundesliga experiment, the latest on potential returns of leagues like the EPL and La Liga and Serie A and MLS. We'll be talking about the compare and contrast between the quality of a club team, a very good club team, versus a very good uh, national team, country team. We'll be talking about who, in our estimation and your estimation, is the Jordan of soccer. You will, yes, finally get my review of The Last Dance and so much more. But first, joining me as always, my friend, my colleague, my guiding light, David Mossy, a soccer savant and a Fox soccer researcher and writer extraordinaire. Mossy, how are you on this Sunday morning? I am doing very, very well. Uh, you mentioned we're going to be talking sports documentaries um, later on. Um, I have a random one for you. This past week, I listened to a fantastic podcast documentary on the footballing history of the city of Rosario, Argentina. Uh, the jumping off point was, have you ever heard of a guy named Trinche Karlovic? Does that name ring a bell at all? Nope. He is a, a player who everyone who have watched him swears is the greatest Argentinian player of all time, uh, better than Messi or Maradona. But he is somebody who never wanted to be famous, never wanted to stray too far from his friends and family. And so he turned down chances to play for the national team, turned down chances to play for bigger clubs, Pele even tried to convince him at one point to play for the Cosmos, and he said no. He was content with spending his whole career playing for small Argentinian clubs. There's virtually no footage of this guy. There's no stats to back up what anybody says, but there's just these firsthand accounts from people that actually watched him. And he recently passed away, sadly, in October of 1993. Maradona signed with Newell's Old Boys, and he met Trinche Karlovic. And such was the legend around this guy that it was actually Maradona that was starstruck. And when Maradona, in fact, played his first match for Newell's old boys, a six-year-old Lionel Messi, Rosario native, was in the stands. Messi soon after signed with the Newell's old boys youth team and embarked on his journey. And so the documentary covers that. It talks about the rivalry in the city between Rosario Central and Newell's old boys, all the prominent figures in Argentinian football history who are either from Rosario or who rose to prominence with one of those two clubs. The whole Marcelo Bielsa coaching tree was forged uh, in Rosario when he coached Newell's old boys in the early 90s. Two of his key players were Tata Martino and Mauricio Pochettino. It even gets into how Che Guevara was from Rosario and was a big Rosario Central fan. It was absolutely fascinating. I loved it. Wow, that sounds awesome. It also sounds like uh, almost, a, not intentionally, but a companion piece to the, uh, and I don't know what the name of the documentary is, but the one where they, they go back and they find that, 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 that inner city street basketball player that everybody, even the big players that went on to great NBA fame, always point to and say, this was the guy. And for whatever reason, it didn't happen. But when, they, when they're asked who the best player is, they always, point, uh, they always point to that. I don't know what the name of the documentary is. Yeah, I no, I, I I think I know what you're referencing. I don't remember it either. But yeah, it is amazing how in these countries there are these sort of urban legends of the you know the best that never was kind of thing, where this guy that could have been the greatest ever and for whatever reason chose not to. It never happened for him. So it was fascinating stuff for sure. Well, I'm glad you're finding uh, new and interesting podcasts out there. As we know, everybody has a podcast, and we we don't take it for granted that you are listening and continuing to listen to this, uh, especially in these times where we found that because uh, all of our routines have been disrupted, where on the surface you would think people are listening more, but they're, they're not necessarily. So we really appreciate you listening to that. And there are incredible things that will be discovered as we go along the way. So Masi, um, those of us that have kids and don't have kids, uh, but people out there that uh, love the whole Star Wars type of thing, uh, and especially when it comes to something, anything new that is associated with Star Wars, we're hooked into the whole Disney Plus thing uh, with The Mandalorian and all, all of that. And so as part of that, what I've been watching uh, with my family is some of these old time Disney movies. Like the other night we, we watched the Swiss Family Robinson. And, um, you know, it's these, this whole era of, I guess, G-rated stories with, uh, you know, that are, that are told a lot of classic stories uh, out there. My kids were, were not enthralled, let's say, by it. As a matter of fact, they spent most of the two hours making fun of anything and everything they possibly could uh, in it. But they did watch it for two hours. Um, and uh, it, uh, it, 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 it showed that 
while great movies certainly can stand the test of time, I'm not sure that this was this was a great movie uh, when it comes to what we're watching. But we're we're finding all sorts of different things, and obviously there's a whole lot of nostalgia right now when you have time on your hands and you you uh, you see things that you saw as a kid and you think that your children will like. It doesn't always translate. I'm not telling people out there anything uh, anything that they don't know, but it's worth a try because every once in a while one of those uh, one of those will uh, will hook on, but. I'm not sure if Swiss Family Robinson uh, does the trick. Mossy, anything else before we, uh, you know, light this candle? No, that's it. All right. Well, let's, uh, let's do it. Um, as you know, we're not doing the, uh, the traditional State of the Union as we uh, have often done. We just jump right into it as we're going to do, uh, uh, as we're going to do now. Uh, and what we're going to start off with here is the continued uh, exploration and experiment that is the Bundesliga. We're recording this on a Sunday. The slate of Bundesliga games have just finished for the uh, for the week and obviously for the weekend. So we now have a much greater sample size, two weeks uh, of games to look at. And it's amazing to me to watch the evolution of both the actual practical application of the game from a, from a competitive standpoint and the production of the game and to see how, you know, how quickly things are changing and being tweaked, uh, so much so that you know, last week we had empty, uh, empty stadium games, and that hasn't changed, and that's not going to change for a number of, uh, well, for who, who, knows, who, who knows how long. That's, uh, so that's going to be a constant. But this week, for example, we had the uh, arrival of the uh, augmented and enhanced uh, audio, uh, and all of the comments and some of the concerns out there uh with that but i'm telling you what mossy it's it, it is it is a competition whether people realize it or not and yes we've talked about the bundesliga being this test case but they are setting the new standard now that everybody is going to have to live up to when it comes to whatever league comes online. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that uh, about that in a second how was your second week uh, as a viewer, how was the experience for you in the Bundesliga? I enjoyed it yet again. I have a lot of thoughts about the action on the field, but before we get to that, do you want to crow a little bit? Because the whole piping in noise has been your big issue, and I think you were proven right. You've more or less won that debate. I don't know. It's not about winning, Mossy. I, 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 you know, I'm. This is. I am benevolent, uh, and I am doing this for the good of the human race. Okay, and for the good of that part of the human race that likes to watch sports and soccer. So I. I I, I do. I'm not. I'm not here to gloat or anything like that. But I, I will also tell you that um, that all enhanced audio games are not created equally. In that we saw, you know, for example, um, you know, the first game with with Red Bull, where it was piped in, uh, and when I say piped in, it, it's not in the stadium. Okay, it's done by the broadcaster and it's an option like subtitles or something like that. You can say, I want to have it or not. We at Fox last week, we didn't have it. This week, as a matter of fact, uh, on Sunday, we had three games. The first game didn't have it. And then the next two did. So there was actually this interesting juxtaposition and, and compare and contrast between it. And as soon as we in the United States here started showing the game with that enhanced audio, uh, Twitter exploded, uh, everybody exploded. It was it was balanced, but I do think that the majority ultimately thought that it was a better viewing experience and obviously uh, a sounding experience than uh, than it happened uh, than it happened in the past. Am I? You think I'm? I'm I got my my finger on the pulse uh, of the way people reacted to this, Mossy? Absolutely, yeah. The reaction I saw on Twitter was generally positive. Even people that were uh initially against this after the fact it sort of admitted that yeah i didn't mind it at all it was actually better this way and it's it, it's interesting because there was a whole new job job being created not necessarily a new job for an audio engineer they've always had audio engineers but there is a there's a new artist out there if you will this person or persons whoever he or she may be that is responsible for what for when and how much of that audio is used. And as I said, each game is created differently and maybe there's different people working different games and you are subject to um, the size of the stadium matters, the 
uh, the bank of the sound samples that you are using for each different game matters. The different mix levels between the actual live, uh, and we know it's it's sparse, and the um, you know, and the sound samples that are being used and how that mixes, because it's not as if this completely replaced what was happening in the stadium. They just mixed them together. And how much or little you use goes into how well or how successful that audio uh, enhancement uh, is. So it was, it was fascinating to, to see and to see the reaction. Um, I will say this. There, there were people out there that were, were telling me that, you know, somehow, well, first off, we're not fooling anybody, okay? This isn't being done on the sly, okay? Everybody understands and knows this. So this isn't a fake news-ish type of situation, okay? This, this is being done, everybody understands it, and it's being done to give you the soundtrack, the traditional soundtrack that is, for lack of a better phrase, the comfort food that we associate with sports. And that's a good thing. Uh, fans are not being, and, and supporters and crowds are not being replaced. However, I will say this, uh, I think what it means to be a crowd, what it means to be a supporter, what it means to be a fan is constantly evolving. And even in this time, it's evolving. So I don't know what a crowd and supporter looks like in the future, because we don't know what the future is going to, uh, going to look like. Um, it was not perfect, as I said. But I think it at least approximated a lot of the look and the sound of what is a normal game. And as I said, it's, this is the new benchmark. And there's other leagues and there's other sports that are going to come online. And they're going to have to live up to this or in, improve on this because there is going to be that, uh, that comparison. Um, I, I just think it uh, – I, I do think that it worked out well. Uh, I do think that there was that comfort and that return to a comfort that we have associated with, uh, uh, with the games. But it, it, like everything, that person's going to ride that fader and there are going to be good and bad times and there are going to be good and bad performances when it comes to that person and they're going to continue to tweak it. So I'll be interested to see this week coming up. We got some big games midweek. We got games on the weekend. What that looks like uh, going forward. Yeah, and as far as the action on the field, Bayern and Dortmund both held serve. Bayern beat Frankfurt 5-2 in a bit of a crazy game. Uh, Dortmund had a nice and tidy 2-0 win away to Wolfsburg, so the gap is four points between those teams, and they will meet uh, Tuesday at the Westfalen Stadion. Uh, so it should be a fun one, the latest edition of their classicer, Lewandowski and Holland going head-to-head -head against each other. Uh, Leipzig are third. They hammered Mainz. Timo Werner with a hat-trick. Leverkusen leaped into the top four, uh, winning 3-1 away to Gladbach. And I would say Kai Havertz has been the breakout yep. star of these two rounds here. Uh, four goals in two games, flourishing in this kind of false nine role in the absence of Kevin Volland. And, you know, we talk about the Bundesliga being a breeding ground for young stars, and we talk about Sancho and Holland. He's right up there. I mean, who knows what the transfer market's going to look like, but under normal circumstances, he would be like a 100 million euro player, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we already knew that this was an up and coming player, but that he jumped back into the scene, especially a scene that so many people are curious and watching. It's, it's only going to raise his value, um, but it's also going to be relative to the new world that we are living in. Question for you, Masi. You're a, you're a numbers guy. Uh, you're an analytics guy. You appreciate that. I'm not saying you're not romantic, but you are also pragmatic when it comes to the numbers. Is it too small a sample size right now? Because we have had 18 games. Of those 18 games, there have only been three home wins of those 18 games. There have been 10 losses out of those 18 games. Are we seeing, I think earlier on Twitter, I said the death of home field advantage. I think that's probably a little harsh. But are we seeing the, the, the fading out a, a little bit of the home field advantage? And look, we, we understand that when humans are involved, as humans are involved in terms of refereeing, you're always subject to your surroundings and you are impacted and influenced by your surroundings. Are we seeing that play out or is the sample size too small right now? And it's just a matter of, well, oftentimes the away team was better than the home team. And that would have been the same no matter if they'd had the home field advantage or not. No, I think you can start to uh, deduce that when you remove crowds from a game, it does uh, diminish the home field advantage. So yeah, I think in these uh, empty stadium games, we're going to see that kind of level out, you know, generally teams perform better at home than away, but I don't think that's going to necessarily be the case here. Uh, so yeah, that is a new wrinkle that we're going to have to get used to here as we play in empty stadium for the foreseeable future. I think that I don't think it's, it's that small sample to start drawing that conclusion. 
and I will say it's it's also about the optics. And we saw this week a much greater emphasis on the tarping of stadiums. And we actually had a good compare and contrast with a couple of the games where one stadium was tarped. Uh, and I thought I thought it looked a lot cleaner. And I think the impact of then the sound was enhanced because of the lack because the 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 problem at times, and this is where the communication between the broadcasters have to happen, uh, where the, the sound and the picture have to marry up. So oftentimes you would see an empty stadium shot, but with the crowd noise. And sometimes that's that's a little bit jarring. And so having the the tarps on certain games, I thought that that was, that that was beneficial. Um, and I think going forward, I, look, I think the next step, I guess, is LED boards uh, that flash pictures of crowds and so now you're enhancing the actual pictures of it with crowds and I don't think that that's too far out of reach for people to do but it does bring up an important thing is that as this level uh, continues to rise the expectations rise and every league right now is going to be compared to what the Bundesliga is doing or has done and they're going to have to live up to it and we're going to talk a little bit later about you know, some of the other leagues and the different ways that they are anticipating coming back. And if you are giving a product that doesn't match up and doesn't live up to what the Bundesliga is doing or has done, I think your product's going to suffer. And so it is this arms race, if you will, to make sure that when you come online, you are able to be in the same sentence and in the same company of what the Bundesliga is doing. And once again, credit to the Bundesliga for being the first one out. They, they had the ability because of their country and culture and what they were, but they've come out of the shoot. And I think whatever grade I gave them last week, it just rises in terms of the grade of what they're doing. And just two more teams I want to mention before we move on. Uh, Hertha Berlin continuing to look good. They hammered Union Berlin on Friday. My boy, Matthias Queen with another goal and Schalke get drilled three nil at home by Augsburg. And listen, we talked about this last week. I know it's unique circumstances, but when every other team in the top half of the table has their act together to a certain degree and, and is looking reasonably competent and Schalke or not, then David Wagner has to answer for that. Absolutely. We've talked about the fact that everybody was in the same type of situation relative. And your individual work that you did in the off, in whatever this off season we're calling it, or, or, or in this lockdown, and the collective work that you did was going to be on display. And that they have come back and looked like they were all just kind of hanging out and playing video games and not doing anything. Now, I'm not saying that they were, but that's what they look. It's completely fair to judge uh, David Wagner and his team on what they're doing. Uh, when, as it comes to from an American perspective, you know, Weston McKinney, you know, last week, I think he acquitted himself well, and he, he hasn't done anything to change that in that there is this feeling that Weston McKinney is good and he's trying to be everything to, to everybody on that team and trying to do a lot of things by himself. And at times he can, but I, I, I still remain a little concerned about Weston McKinney. Um, I, I think he may need a change of scenery. I think he may need to get to a, a situation in a team where he's not asked to do so much but then, while I am cautiously optimistic, I am not completely convinced that he can do that. If he is just a player that wings it uh, and, and doesn't really play a position or can't play a certain position or can't do something, a specific role, that's going to be a problem for him. And indirectly, and directly, that's going to be a problem for Greg Berhalter and, uh, and the national team. So while I, I still remain optimistic that Weston McKitty can be an important part for the U.S. men's national team, uh, this is still, it's starting to get me. And, and once again, I might be being shaded completely by the fact that he's playing for a team that is so in disarray that he's just not, he's just not looking good. But I can't remember the last time that I saw Weston McKinney play a strategic and mature type of game individually where it looked like he knew what his role was and then he went out there and he implemented it on a consistent basis. And, and that, that could be a problem going forward. I don't know, Masi, what, what are your thoughts on that before we move on? No, I agree with you. And yeah, Schalke, this, it was a real feel-good season there for a while and it really looks like it could unravel here. Um, and we'll end on this with the Bundesliga. I mentioned Dortmund host Bayern on Tuesday. Uh, what are the particulars on that as far as network and time? Okay, so we uh, so that's a twelve thirty kick uh, Eastern, nine thirty a.m. Uh, for uh, the classic car, right? Where is that, Mossy? Where is that being played? Uh, 
I, I call it Westfalen Stadium. Others call it Signal Iduna Park, uh, but it's in Dortmund. Dortmund are the home team. Well, you're a traditionalist, right? I mean, that's, <laughs> that's, that's, that's how you roll. It's in Dortmund. So, I mean, it's a, it is a big game if – look, I mean, I think that the season or that the title hinges on this game. If, if Bayer go in – and I know going into somebody else's home isn't isn't what it used to be <laughs> a couple of weeks ago. But if they, if Bayern go in there and and finish them off, then I think it's done and dusted. But you know, either way, it, it's uh, it will be fun. The game will be fun. We know that this is arguably the biggest game of uh, the Bundesliga. So that person, that enhanced audio artist, I'm going to call him or her, is going to be that much more important in terms of their performance uh, on the day and making that experience something, uh, something memorable. I can't, I can't wait to watch it and I can't wait to see uh, what ultimately happens. You mentioned, you know, likes of Gio Reyna, who we know was, was set to start a few weeks ago, came in as a sub, so he's okay, he's okay physically, how that all works out. The, uh, I tell you what, the, uh, it wasn't a hot take by any stretch of the imagination, but our takes last week with, uh, with regards to Alfonso Davies and what he is, what he isn't, what he is in CONCACAF, what he is in the world. Uh, there's a lot of people out there that have takes when it comes to uh, Alfonso Davies and how good he actually is or how good he, he isn't. And I, as I said before, I think I can certainly make an argument for him being the best left back in the world. I can certainly make an argument for him being the best player from CONCACAF, uh, as we did last week. But the debate will continue. But I think everybody, regardless of where you stand on that, recognizes that this is not just a great young player, but this is a great player and potentially could be one of the greats when all is said and done. A credit to him and, uh, and all the work that he is doing. So looking forward to seeing him. All right, Mossy, uh, quickly, let's go around for some other leagues and we'll, we'll circle back to MLS because I know what we, we want to talk about that. But there has been some news uh, and possibly some progress in terms of the other leagues in Europe and the, and the big leagues out there in Europe coming back online. Take us through that. Well, La Liga looks to be the next league here that's locked and loaded. They've been training since early May with an eye towards a mid-June return, and the government has signed off on that. So it's not completely official yet, but all signs point to La Liga returning on Friday, June 12th, with the uh, Seville Derby, Sevilla against Betis. Um, and they're going to pick up where they left off, which is match, match day 28. There are 11 rounds left. Barcelona lead Real Madrid by two points. Uh, it's going to be empty stadiums, five subs per team, but everybody playing in their own stadium, none of this neutral venue stuff. And the games are going to count towards everything, the title, relegation. There, there's no debate there. Um, so uh, that those one, of you that, that one, just so I'm clear, unless something changes, that one has been approved by the, the, the Spanish uh, authorities, right? Yeah, I, I don't know if it's 100% official, but all signs point okay. to being June 12th. Uh, so looks like Messi will be back in our lives in three okay. weeks. Um, June 12th is also the date the Premier League was targeting. It looks like that might get pushed back by a week or two. They still have uh, some logistics to sort out. They're a little bit behind on the training front. But the big development there since the last time we spoke is they've scrapped the neutral venue idea. A majority of the clubs were against it. And in further consultation with the police and, and the government, it's been determined that teams can play in their own stadiums as, as long as they uh, adhere by all the security guidelines. So it looks like when the Premier League resumes, it will be everybody playing in their own stadium, which I presume will put to bed that whole relegation issue because you had teams in the bottom of the table that were arguing that if games were played in a neutral venue, then you shouldn't relegate anybody under those circumstances. If everybody gets to play in their own stadium, then I think that puts that issue to bed and, and yeah. Yeah. Uh, we can all abide by the results. So um, still some, some details to sort out there to get everybody on board. But I think the Premier League is trending towards a late June uh, return now. Um, Serie A seems the fuzziest of all of them. They, they were targeting mid-June as well, but now the government is not completely ready to sign off on that. And so who the heck knows? They, they do want to come back eventually. Keep in mind, all these leagues want to be done by the end of July because August has been more or less reserved for the Champions League and the Europa League. So the, the idea, UEFA told all the leagues, ideally we want you to be done by the end of July and then August will be all about the Champions League and the Europa League. Um, and switching over to this part of the world. Hold, uh, on, hold on a second. Let me make sure. And so just so I know uh, and so I'm clear, if and when, not if and when, well, I guess if and when for some of these leagues, when they are done with what amounts to the 2019-2020 uh, season, 
uh, then you said there's two months that are at least at this point being looked at as European type of competition, right? Well, one month, August. August. Okay, August for European competition, and then, and then what? They just turn right back around and start playing in September. <laughs> How does yeah, this? Yeah, it'd be a very short break. It sounds like, and then we'd start the 2021 season up. So yeah, it, it's going to be kind of weird. The seasons are going to kind of bump up against each other. Yeah, the date I've seen. For the Champions League final, they're, they're hoping for, I, I think I saw August 29th in Istanbul. Uh, so, yeah, so they would presumably start up the knockout uh, stage in, sometime in August and be able to whip through all the quarterfinals, semifinals and stuff, and then play that final. Wow. Um, so. Well, it's still, I mean, look, as we say each and every week, uh, the one thing that we don't know or that we do know is that nobody really knows anything. Uh, we're getting some some details going through, but until a referee puts a whistle uh, in their mouth and whistles, you know, none of this is, none of this is for sure. And this is constantly changing as can be expected because this is unprecedented what we're going through. Uh, okay, Mossy, let's bring it back a little bit uh, home. And I'm sure we'll be talking in the next couple of weeks about all of those leagues that we just, uh, you, you just mentioned and maybe some more details um, as we, uh, as we drill down going forward. Go ahead, Mossy. Well, in this part of the world, um, League MX, they've pulled the plug on the Klausuda uh, they're not anywhere close to being able to play even behind closed doors. Uh, I read this week Santos Laguna had like 15 players test positive for the coronavirus. So we were 10 rounds into the Clausura, seven rounds to go, plus the Liguilla. They've decided to just pull the plug on it. Uh, Cruz Azul and Leon, who were the top two in the standings, have earned CCL berths. And now they're just going to concentrate on trying to start the Apertura on time, which would have been in July uh, is when it's scheduled for. So we'll see if that's even possible. But so. well, I mean, but even in, in, in a strange way, the structure of Liga MX with the two separate types of season lends itself to kind of splitting, splitting things up, uh, uh, up going forward. But, you know, I mean, all of this, as we said before, is being done with the recognition that, you know, you don't want to put anybody uh, in, in harm's way and you don't want to do anything because it's, it is just, it's just sports. As much as we love it, uh, it's still just sports. And but with also the recognition, as we said last week, that nothing is a hundred percent safe, uh, no matter what. Even in the best of times, it's not hundred percent safe. But uh, erring on the side of caution, I think, is 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 smart, both from a, a health standpoint and from as these teams try to pick up whatever that new version of that league is uh, or that next season of that league or that next part of the season of the league as it uh, as it uh, as is the case in Mexico and one larger point that'll get us into talking MLS here uh in these European leagues uh the biggest point of contention more so than the title has been relegation and how mm -hmm. to handle that and so that is something that uh, League MX and MLS don't have to deal with, which, listen, I don't want to go down a pro rel rabbit hole. Obviously, this is a very different conversation during normal circumstances. But during these unique circumstances, we can at least acknowledge that not having relegation is one less headache to have to worry about as you're trying to figure out whether to play or not and what kind of format and, and whether the games count. And so uh, MLS obviously has never had it. And League MX, they very recently decided to pull the plug on it. So they don't have to concern themselves with any of that. So uh, yeah. so that gets us to MLS. Uh, Let's do it. All right. So uh, we mentioned last week that this potential Orlando plan uh, existed. Um, it's It seems like, and correct me if I'm wrong, Mossy, it's much more of a reality now than when we were talking a week ago, right? Yeah. And the, the plan that's being proposed is they're going to have all 26 teams based in the uh, Disney uh, – resort in Orlando yep. uh, under strict quarantine there, lockdown, and they're going to play a mini tournament. They're going to divide the 26 teams into four groups, three groups of six and one of eight. Uh, they wanted it to be all even number groups. There are going to be two Western Conference groups. Uh, the seeded teams there are going to be LAFC by virtue of having won the Supporter Shield last season and Seattle Sounders by virtue of having won MLS Cup. Then you're going to have two Eastern Conference groups, the seeded teams there are going to be Orlando City by virtue of being the quote-unquote hosts of this tournament. And then I've read different things on whether it's going to be Atlanta United or Toronto FC as the other seeded team. I'm a little bit unclear on that. And Nashville is going to be the team that's going to move over into one of the Eastern Conference groups to avoid having odd-numbered groups. So essentially, you're going to play a round-robin group play, and then the top two in each group would advance to the knockout stage. Now, here's the part that I 
maybe I'm misreading this, but you can tell me. But from what I read, uh, the knockout tournament doesn't really mean anything beyond, hey, as long as we're down there, we might as well like have some fun and crown a champion. It's only the group games that count in terms of your 2020 MLS record, correct? And then uh, the idea is that uh, the season is going to resume again normally at some point later in the year with teams being able to play in their own in their own stadiums and then the record is going to carry over from the group play of this tournament i might have totally misread that but no i think i think you're right in that a certain amount of games let's call it the five games that you play will count for your record in the 2020 season but i do also think that the carrot for winning this tournament is CONCACAF champ- is potentially a CONCACAF champions league spot so i i do think that there is something on the line uh, and there should be something on the line because if you're going to ask players to do this in this unique type of situation and spend however many weeks it is uh, there and quarantined, albeit with uh, you know a very luxurious type of quarantine uh, down there with uh, with their team and away from their families, there should be a a reason to to do this from a competitive uh, competitive side. The thing that I didn't understand initially and and now I do is that. This is only a component of the 22 or 20, 2020 season in that this doesn't finish the season. This is just a stopgap until the anticipated return of the season uh, back in your home market later on in the summer fall. Uh, so this isn't, this isn't taking the place. This is a, almost a standalone event that does have consequence in terms of the standings. Now, uh, a couple of things. Uh, number one, if uh, the Bundesliga is, is any indication, then Orlando can't catch a break because, <laughs> because even in the best of the times they struggle and now being actual home hosts for uh, the entire tournament, uh, we know that that doesn't, uh, that doesn't change when, when it comes to uh, with, with, uh, with what we've seen in, uh, in the Bundesliga. The, the concept of it, it intrigues me. I think it would. I think it will be entertaining. I think it will be exciting. I think, as we always say, it's better than nothing. But just because it's better than nothing doesn't mean that it's that it's good. I do like, I, I do like the format, um, and certainly I will watch it. But I, I will stress again, if this, from a production standpoint, pales in comparison to the soccer that is already being played now. If this, and we said it's down in Orlando, and that environment down in Orlando, while they have beautiful fields, it is, it is almost like a, a, a youth park. It's, it's a very nice youth park, but it's certainly not the stadium type of environment that we are seeing right now in the Bundesliga. And so how they dress this up from the outside, I think, is going to be huge. Because if this looks like either a, just a preseason tournament uh, when we, you know, when you stream preseason games and there's one camera up and the guy's going back and forth, or if this looks like a high school type of environment, and it should be noted that uh, there are also reports out that the NBA is also looking at uh, at the uh, Wide World of Sports facility that Disney has down there. So there may be a lot of athletes and leagues that are that are doing this. But you know, once again, if it if it looks rinky dink, um, that could I think that's going to be. I think that's going to be a problem. So I'm sure the, you know, the, the minds of MLS are hard at work thinking on how that production is going to, uh, going to go. And then, you know, we should say that, and, and I think we said this last week, that the reporting of guys like Paul Tenorio and Sam Stagecoe and uh, these guys out there that have gotten a lot of this information, because it's still not public, but I mean, you know, the, the biggest leakers in the world are, are MLS, by the way. <laughs> nothing, nothing stays secret when it, comes, uh, when it comes to MLS. But, you know, also part of, uh, part of this, I guess we're, we're calling it this, uh, this, this concept, is games in the morning and games in the evening. We still know that it's in Florida, and it's a Florida in the summer, and it's going to be hot. It always is. And so having a game early morning and then having games – not just at night, but even later at night, even 10 o'clock possible kickoffs, which obviously would, would, would benefit and would probably be used for West Coast types of, uh, types of viewing. But it, it'll be a very different and unique type of existence and situation for any of these players uh, to, uh, you know, to, to partake in. And it, they're not all on board yet. Uh, we, you know, we saw Alejandro Bedoya uh, over on my friend and colleague uh, over uh, at ESPN, uh, Taylor Twelman's show, I think it's called Banter, uh, talking about how, you know, he's not necessarily sold on this. 
and he wants to know what it is. And look, there's a whole business behind that, uh, that attitude. And I, I get it and I can understand from a player's perspective, but you know, you're going down there for a bunch of weeks. Uh, you're going to leave your family. And when it comes to the safety of you, the staff that is involved and prioritizing and making sure that the protocols are in place so that players do feel comfortable. And I, I'm, I don't think you can force them to go. So what players decide, you know what? I don't need to do it. And either they take the hit from a financial perspective and maybe they can and don't care if they're doing that. Or is there uh, a general consensus that, hey, we are doing this for our team and for our league and for our sport and we are all together. And there certainly will be individual cases that are completely understandable, uh, whether we'll find out about the reasons why or not. But you know, it's easy to judge people from the outside what this ultimately looked like. So in general, though, Masi, do you think that this will be a success if it comes off in the way that it's being framed right now? It'll be entertaining, but I wonder how soon after do they think they'll be able to play in their own stadiums? Because if it's soon after, then I almost think why not wait and do it that way? It seems a little bit weird, you know, to, to try this sort of crazy outside the box thing when it would only be a few weeks after that where you could resume sort of quote unquote normal season. But I do think that there is a real desire and because this is going to cost, this is going to cost a boatload of money and a boatload of money for a league that we already know is going to lose a tremendous amount of money this year. Even in the best of times, the league uh, and, and individual teams at times are losing, uh, losing money. So this is going to be a, a big expenditure. But I, I also think that whether it's Commissioner Garber or the owners or many people involved in MLS, they look at this as they can't necessarily afford not to be a part of the conversation. And if you go silent at this time when others, because you know damn well that NFL and college football and all the other leagues are, are looking at ways to do things and they're going to spend the money and come hell or high water, let's be honest, at some of these leagues, they're going to find a way to have some sort of product out there and certainly their relationship and, and their reliance on TV money is they're in a very different stratosphere than, than MLS. But MLS is always trying to be in the conversation as one of the major leagues in the United States and in North America. And if they are not because they aren't doing anything, the brand of MLS could potentially suffer. And I think that's where the impetus of a lot of this resides. And that's why I think MLS is willing to say, you know what, we're going to spend a good chunk of money to do something like this to tide us over to that moment when we get back to the, the stadium. But you're right. If, if then they just turn around, go back home and play a game in their, in their home stadium, it, it, yeah, I mean, but I think they're just going to have to recognize that, it's, that this is, the once again, the best bad solution <laughs> and and that's what they're going to go with anything else mossy about uh, what we're seeing right now that is it all right well it's it's as we said it's constantly changing and we will continue to uh you know try to figure it all out there's a lot of information flying around and there's some people doing some great work out there getting that information out but it does constantly constantly change and whether it's the actual dates whether it's the protocols whether it's the the structure of these leagues when they're coming back it is constantly changing and until someone's kicking a ball and someone's blowing a whistle like i said we're not going to actually know if it is going to exist but it's still fun to, to contemplate and to and to think about but they will all have been watching Everybody is watching. Everybody is looking for best practices out there to either take exactly or to tweak or to improve on when they do come back because everybody wants to be that shining light that says, hey, look at us. We're doing it in a better way. We're doing it in a different way. And MLS, I don't think, can afford to not be part of that not just conversation, but part of that comp uh, competition. All right, Mossy, when we come back, you know it, you love it, or you don't, but you got to listen to it anyway if you got the, if you got this clicked. We're going to go uh, do some Ask Alexi questions uh, and Ask Mossy questions, and we're going to you know, see what you, uh, you want to know over the last week. All right, we'll be back in a second. Okay, welcome back. It's time for Ask Alexi. You use that hashtag Ask Alexi out there on all the uh, social media platforms, and you send us your comments and questions and concerns, and we pick a few each week as we are about to do, and Mossy reads them off. All right, Mossy, what do the people want to know this week? First up, at Jersey Devs 2 k should I dump my stock in Man United? <laughs> okay. Oh, my goodness. All right, well, what's, what is this referencing? I mean, this is kind of an evergreen at, <laughs> at this point, right? I mean, what's it, what do you think he's talking about? Well, 
Our producer, Alex Dowd, seems to think it might have something to do with a recent Ole Gunnar Solskjaer quote in which Ole said, I'd rather have a hole in my squad than an a-hole. Oh, Alex Dowd is convinced that this question has something to do with that <laughs> quote. So uh, well, we have to have Jersey devs on to, to confirm that. But I mean, look, if, if this is a stock, uh, this, is, this is one of those blue chips that is going through a period where the, the loss of value is an opportunity, right? At least that's what y- you may think. The problem is, is that this, this rebuild uh, or this step to go, one step to go backwards for two steps to go forward seems to be lasting a lot longer than people <laughs> anticipated. And the, the, the shine that was Manchester United is, is not only a thing of the past, but it's getting to be a point where people are starting to forget what it's like. And that's dangerous territory because if you start losing the, press, the pressure of returning to the top um, or even close to the top, let's be honest, then you can very easily become complacent. And that's, that's my concern right now. Um, I, I think you know the brand value of Manchester United is still going to resonate. It is still going to attract attention. It is still going to have me and many people around the world be curious as to what's going on. Some of people are going to continue to hate watch and are just in 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 heaven right now, seeing the continued problems or the lack of progress. But I don't know, Masi. Do you does does where? Does where Manchester United finds itself right now, does it give you any optimism that it is heading in the right direction and in that direction is back to the glory land? I'm going to tell you something. Oh, boy. Um, Who knows how any team is going to come out of this situation, but the period of time right before play was suspended was the best I felt about Manchester United in a very long time. They nailed the Bruno Fernandes signing. His arrival has sort of galvanized the whole team. They were playing some really good football. They were uh, just three points out of fourth place, uh, rolling along in the Europa League knockout stage, looking like one of the favorites to win that competition, and in the quarterfinals of the FA Cup. And this was shaping up to be an exciting end of the season here for Manchester United. And then spinning it forward to the transfer market, they do have to figure out what they're going to do with Paul Pogba. And I suspect this Solskjaer quote about a-holes might perhaps be a veiled shot at Pogba. But there was also a lot of Jaden Sancho buzz. And you know how big a fan I am of Sancho. I'm also a huge fan of Rashford. And if you could pair Sancho with Rashford, to me, you have like the two great English talents of the next 10 years to build your attack around. So I actually, again, going back to early March, right before play was suspended, uh, was, was the first time in a long time they started to see some light at the end of the tunnel and feel some positivity in this dark cloud lifting and United fans seem to be starting to feel good about themselves and believing in where they were going. A lot of it has to do with Bruno Fernandes. There were even some people con- comparing his arrival to Virgil van Dijk's arrival at Liverpool in January of 2018 and the galvanizing effect that van Dijk's arrival had. So actually, I, I don't know. Who knows what things are going to look like when we come out of this situation we're in. But I mean, but at your, least your we're, optimism, we're in March. Your optimism there, it, it's tinged with surprise. And so my question, Mossy, is... Does this absolve the powers that be in the leadership from what, at least from the outside, has looked like at times ineptitude, okay? In that, look, rebuilds, and we're going to get to uh, the last dance in a little bit, but we all (laughs) recognize that in sports, there comes a time where you do have to take a step back, not because you want to, but because you have to, in order to reboot, in order to reload, and nobody's saying that that Manchester United can't do that. Now, to the, ex- the extent that they they do it and have done it, that's where you, it, it gets into questionable situation uh, in that these super clubs, while they can go through an off period or time, it's about how far back they regress in order to go in order to go forward. So is this just coming out of that hole, but with an acceptance that, you know what? They, they stayed true to the, well, in this case, it would be Ole, but and there certainly were others that came before, and they gave him the time, and therefore they're being rewarded for that? Or is this just a situation where 
eventually it's going to come good because of the amount of money and the amount of talent uh, that this team is able to bring in. Yeah, no, I don't think even if they get their act together now and, and enjoy success under social, I don't think it absolves how bad they handled that post Ferguson era. Uh, it should not have been like a seven, eight year <laughs> rebuild uh, <laughs> to get back to prominence and having to run through all these different managers and, and spend all the money they did and, and some of the failed signings. So no, it, it does not all of a sudden absolve it if they, if they get it right now, but, it, but still you have to say they, they might have a little something going on here. Manchester United for the first time in a while might actually be on the path to something. All right, so my final answer to you, Jersey Devs 2, 2K, is that, no, I don't think you should dump your Manchester United stock. However, if you dump it, okay, it's not because you are a fair weather fan. It's not because you don't have a passion, okay? It's, it's because, it's actually because you have been disrespected. You have been promised something and not delivered that. And I think that it is human. I think it is normal. I think it is fair for someone to say, you know what? I don't want to be treated like that. And I'm not happy with this product. And I know when I say product, people go crazy. But that sometimes people that do something like that, they will be accused of being, they're not really supporters. You're not really a fan. No, that's not, that's not the case at all. The there is a give and take and there is an understanding of what you are what you are promised and what you are given okay and i think that if jersey devs or anybody else that's a manchester united supporter says no i was i was not given the value that i was promised and for that there are repercussions so uh do what you want jersey devs i'd I'd stick around, but I'm, I'm curious and I'm not, you know, a Manchester United supporter in the traditional sense. And so therefore it's maybe a little easier for me to just say, look, I've had enough, right? You've, you've burned me now for so many years that uh, I'm sick of it and I don't want to do that. All right, Mossy, moving on. What, what else? Uh, not moving on to a next uh, segment, but moving on in terms of our Ask Alexi. Next question. At Kirby Wu 71 would a top club team beat the World Cup champ? Ooh. Okay. Uh, my quick answer to you is yes. And I'm sure everybody's wheels are spinning and you're going to come up with this, a lot of the same reasons that I would in that, you know, what's the biggest challenge for any national team and any national team coach? It's time, right? You have very limited time with the players and they are all coming from different leagues, different teams, different ideologies, different backgrounds, different uh you know, structures when it comes to how they play and the philosophy of play. And you're trying to meld them all together in a very short period of time. And that's, you know, that's the challenge and the difficulty for any coach, as opposed to a club team that is there day after day after day. And yes, look, you can find national teams that will beat up on club teams. So I guess you'd have to, you have to pick teams and say, would this team beat, would, would this team beat this team? So, you know, for example, you know, let's take the best of a Barcelona team or the best of a Real Madrid team or a best of a Man City team uh, out there in whatever last 10 years, if you will, and put them up against um, a France or something like that. I still think that the, the routine and the understanding and the coordination and the communication that is so much further advanced on a club, in a club situation would win out and would win out uh, the majority of time. And I'm not saying that, you know, that Atlanta United playing against, I don't know, pick a, a Brazil, pick your best Brazil team or your best Spain team. So that's, that's, you know, that's, that's not a necessarily a fair comparison out there. Mossy, what do you think? Yeah. Generally speaking, the level of play in the upper echelon of the club game is considered higher than in the upper echelon of the international game. World Cups are fun. It's tremendous pageantry and prestige. But the highest level of soccer now is considered to be in the knockout stages of the Champions League. But I don't think the difference is so pronounced that if you reduce it to one game, it's like a given that a Liverpool or a Man City would beat France. I think one, in a one-game scenario, it could be a competitive match and France could win. But just generally speaking, I agree with you. The level of play, I think, is higher at club level than international level for the reasons you mentioned. And look, if, if you're Messi, for example, okay, 
Now, I, I don't, I don't know, but I'm, I'm assuming that he feels something when he plays for Argentina. Obviously, he feels pressure, but I do believe that he feels pride for putting that shirt on. But if you just looked at it purely from a soccer perspective and a competitive perspective, it's probably a whole lot more, I'm going to use the word fun. I don't know if that's the right word. It's probably a whole lot more fun for Messi to play with Barcelona than it is for him to play with Argentina because of the talent that he is surrounded with, because of the innate uh, and uh, you know, integral type of understanding and way of playing and philosophy that he has been a part of and the part of for so many, for so many years. I, but I mean, so let's, let's think, let's think this through. Give me a team then from a national team perspective. And I agree with you on a one-off game, anything, anything can happen. And they would, it's not as if they would just go out there and win 10, nothing or anything like that. But, you know, for example, this, this France team that, uh, that won the previous world cup, would they beat uh, the current Manchester city team? Yeah, it'd be a, a competitive game. I would favor Manchester yeah. City. I mean, look, it's it Mbappe, Griezmann, Pogba, yeah. Conte, Varane. There's no chopped liver, but I just think, you know, you look at the talent City have and the cohesion, I, I think you'd have to give the edge to Manchester City. Yeah, and this is, you know, this is, once again, this is not anything that we, we and others that cover, for example, a World Cup don't say. We understand that, and, and part of, for me, at least for me, part of the... Uh, the romance and part of the interest is how these national teams go about putting together these teams to actually function. And so when you see a national team that is able to play a certain style over a period of games, either over years or over even within a tournament, I mean, I, I think that, it, that that's a, it's an incredible skill, first and foremost, of the manager or the coach to be able to impart that onto a group of players in such a limited time. And we talked to, uh, uh, to Greg Berhalter a few weeks ago on uh, our indoor soccer show and a guy who needs every single second that he can have with these guys is now going to have even less time because of the pandemic. And that's going to impact. And let's be honest, that is going to hurt his ability to establish a cohesiveness and an understanding of uh, of how to play. Uh, anything else on this uh, this question, Mossy? Before we move on, uh, no. Uh, we'll end on this uh, at Swedish Hammer. Who would you say is the Jordan of soccer? Oh, interesting, interesting, interesting. The Jordan of soccer. Okay, well, I, I guess I should state then first and foremost that I do believe that Michael Jordan is the best player ever to play the game. Now. I say that with the understanding that I, I only have a certain frame of reference uh, that's relative to my years on the planet. And I have not watched a whole lot of, of other players, but for me, he's the best player on the planet. And it is subjective, uh, best player of all time. So it's hard because I have to find an equivalent of the best player of all time, or who I feel could potentially be the best player of all time. And that, that narrows it down, right? So in my era and my time, you're looking at a, a handful of players. You're looking at Messi's. You're looking at, uh, you know, Cristiano Ronaldo, Ronaldinho, old, uh, you know, uh, Brazilian Ronaldo. Uh, you're looking at, I don't know, Zlatan, Zidane. These types of uh, these types of uh, of players. Uh, but then you have someone like because. Uh, you know, knowing the attitude, and we're going to talk more about this later, but knowing what Jordan was and the attitude, I'm trying to find someone to compare him to. And so someone like Roy Keane, for example, uh, comes, comes to mind. Uh, I mentioned Zlatan. I mean, this is, this is a hard thing. If I have to say, though, um, I think that it would probably be Cristiano if I have to compare him to one. And look, it's, it's not, a, it's not, I know that there's plenty of things and plenty of parts of their personality that are very, very different, but I would probably have to say Cristiano. I don't know. You, Masi, what are your thoughts on this? Well, there are different ways to interpret this question. I look at it this way. You're never going to get 100% of fans to agree that an athlete is the greatest ever in his sport, but there are certain athletes where 
it's a high enough percentage where you can say there's more or less a consensus there. It's more or less an established fact that he's the greatest ever. And Michael Jordan has clearly attained that with basketball fans. The only soccer player who at uh, any point in his career, I think, attained a similar level of consensus would be Pele in the period between the 1970 and 1986 World Cups, the two World Cups in Mexico. Um, you know, when he won that third World Cup title in Mexico in 1970, spearheading that great Brazil team, that was his drop the mic moment. That was his equivalent of Michael Jordan hitting the jump shot against Utah in 98. And boy, for the few years after that, uh, you know, if you pulled every soccer fan around the world, I think you'd be hard pressed to find too many people who didn't think Pele was the greatest player of all time at that point. So I think there was about a period of like, like I said, 16 years after that, where there was more or less a consensus around Pele being the greatest of all time. And then it took Maradona doing what he did in Mexico in 86 for it to become a debate again. And more recently, you've had Messi and Ronaldo. And now it's become very much a debate. And, and, and so the same thing could happen to Michael Jordan. LeBron could win a couple more titles or another player could come along. And 15, 20 years from now, we could be having a very different conversation than we're having now. Um, and it is worth noting, if you go back and look at interviews from Pele when he played or shortly after his retirement, he was much more humble. And it's only in more recent times where he's grown insecure about his legacy as his fans have died out and there are multiple generations of fans now who never watched him play. And it's become increasingly acceptable to argue that somebody other than Pele is the greatest player of all time. And so now he's adopted this persona, which frankly, as a Brazilian, I find a tad unbecoming where he goes out of his way to, to, to tout that he's the greatest player of all time and to diminish his rivals and take shots at Maradona and Messi. And it's only recently that Pele has sort of adopted that stance. And I think we might be witnessing a similar transformation with Michael Jordan because, you know, all the footage from the last dance was sitting in a vault in the NBA headquarters in Secaucus, New Jersey for years. And people were trying to convince him to do something with it. And he said, no, because I think he felt secure enough on his legacy. And I was reading that it was only after LeBron won his third title when, he, when the Cavs beat the Warriors in 2016 and the LeBron Jordan stuff was just starting to become a thing that it was a few days after that final that Jordan signed off on and said, okay, let's go, let's do this. And the last dance project started. And so I think it was, you know, Michael Jordan feeling the need to sort of remind older people how great he was and sort of introduce himself to this younger generation of fans that might relate more with LeBron. So so we ended up getting this last dance documentary out of it, which aired on ESPN, 10 parts. Most people loved it. I, I know you finally binged it this past week. And so the moment has come. Another sizzling Alexi <laughs> television hot take. The world is dying to know. What did you make of it? All right. So a, a couple of things. Just to go back to your point about, about Pele. The reason why I didn't say Pele is going to become apparent as I, as I talk about this uh, this Jordan documentary. And, and, I, and I do think that you are right in that the insecurity of greats uh, shows itself in different ways. And um, people that you didn't think would be insecure about their legacy or the way that they look sometimes will surprise you. Uh, so anyway, so okay. So as everybody knows, I don't watch something unless I can binge it from start to finish. So I did not watch The Last Dance until it was done, which was last week. So I binged it from start to finish, all 10 episodes. And even that in itself may have colored my, uh, my view of this because I wasn't in that weekly diet and that weekly conversation that everyone was having out there on either social media or just in, in general. I mean, it was, it really transcended and was part of the, the water cooler, even though we don't have the water cooler anymore, but that's what people were talking about. I wasn't part of that. So I watched it from start to finish, but I, but I did hear everything that everybody said. I just hadn't watched. All right. So I guess my top line uh, reaction is that, this is and was nothing more than a glorified Jordan commercial. Um, but as we know, and we're made very, very uh, aware of during even the documentary, a Jordan commercial uh, and all Jordan commercials were legendary and were works of art. Uh, hats off to Spike. Uh, also, I think that in the compare and contrast, because that's what happened with 
uh, people saying this is the best documentary ever made, the best sports documentary ever made. The OJ documentary, for example, I feel is 10 times better. Uh, that, that Michael Jordan was and is a bully, and I, even that's a harsh type of word, but I think that's the word that, that fits most right now, uh, or that he needed to and continues to need to either find or create an adversary in, in order to, uh, to motivate himself should be a surprise to no one, okay? But what was interesting and maybe even concerning to me was that this attitude uh, and this personality that is now being deified and glorified and celebrated as we all reminisce um, because it, it appeals to, and I think it reminds us of something that we've lost in our society. And I couldn't help thinking that while I was watching, watching this, I couldn't help thinking that we as a society, whether we say it out loud or not, we think we are soft. Which, and it may, it may actually be true. I, I, I don't know. Everyone has a different opinion. But I do think that there is a large portion of our society that thinks that as not just a country or as a culture, but I think as a, as a human race, we have gone soft. But I also think that, I don't think that Michael Jordan, in the way that he is portrayed, and therefore who he is, I'm not sure he could, could, could exist in today's world. So... And I, and I think that, that that makes us sad that that doesn't exist. So ultimately, I think that this documentary was about nostalgia. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, this was about the good old times. This was about a different time. And I get it because it's natural. But kids uh, or people that don't know a whole lot of, about Jordan and were exposed to this and saw this for the first time, it concerns me that they may see this and they, be, they may be forced to watch this because people are sitting kids down on couches and making them watch it. I know I, saw, I watched it with my kid. I mean, they're watching this as kind of like a PSA and they think that this is what is needed in order to be successful uh, and to be the best. And that's a bunch of BS, okay? It, it's, it's just one way, but it's not the only way. We mentioned Pele. We mentioned, well, we haven't mentioned, but Wayne Gretzky, for example. You don't have to be an okay? Uh, and you don't have to be a bully, and you don't have to be hard, or the antithesis of soft, whatever you define as soft nowadays, in order to be the best, in order to succeed. I also thought that, you know, look, it's, it's, a, it's a production, it's entertainment, but I thought it, it, at times it was overly melodramatic. <laughs> and, uh, and maybe it's to be, maybe, maybe that's exasperated by the times we're living through because I think we've all been given a healthy dose of perspective and to see how serious and important and grandiose this was, I think in these, to watch it specifically in this time, for a lot of people that was an escape and that was wonderful. For me, I kept kind of rolling my eyes and saying, this is, this is just basketball, this is just sports. Um, so anyway, I guess in the final analysis, it was entertaining. I enjoyed it. I would recommend it to people, but is it the greatest doc ever? Are you kidding me? It's not even close. Mossy reaction. Yeah. I mean, I, I, have thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, the, the two bits of criticism I have heard was that it was too much of a Jordan infomercial. And also some people felt like the skipping back and forth between the past and the present was a tad herky jerky at times. Um, so I don't know if you had an issue that's, with that. Yeah, no, that's, yeah, it was a little confusing. Uh, but, you know, it's a, you know, it, it was a, they needed to do that in order to tell the story. I also think that, you know, there were a lot of stories that could have been spun off and would have been as interesting and maybe in a certain sense, even more interesting, you know, different, different teams, different times. I mean, you know, the whole Steve Kerr type of background and story is, is fascinating in, a, in and of itself. And there were a lot of different, uh, a lot of different players out there um, and stories out there that were fast uh, that were fascinating. I also was interested in the dynamic of a basketball team and locker room is very different than that of a soccer team uh, or you know I guess I guess it would be any sport. There are some similarities, but 
the way in which that team functioned, at least the way that it was portrayed on the screen, it was just, it was just different. I, I felt myself, I, I rarely felt myself relating. Now, look, I'm, not, I'm not obviously not relating to the incredible players that they have, but just relating to the, the process that was being depicted on the, on the screen. And maybe that's just to be expected because they're, they're obviously very, very different games. But, you know, the, <laughs> the, you know, the, the cigars or whatever. Um, and I'm not saying that we were, that everyone was angels or anything like that, but it was just, it's just a very different, and they play a lot of games and the travel, and it's, it's a very different type of lifestyle that they are, that they are living. But I, that was a little bit different for me to deal with. It's interesting. They've already announced the next one, uh, which is slated to come out in 2021. It's going to be about Tom Brady and his career. And listen, um, they deserve a benefit of the doubt because the two they've done recently, the OJ and this last dance one were critical and commercial successes. Your, your opinion on the last name is notwithstanding. Um, but I will say when I read this, it, it kind of hit me funny because Tom Brady, is, you know, great player, great career. Nobody denies that, but doesn't strike me as the most compelling character and his career has played out more recently. So, you know, Jordan, it's been just long enough where there is that sort of mystique that mm -hmm. comes with history while uh, with Tom Brady, it's going to be a lot of stuff that happened very recently. So I'm curious to see how that's going to go. I'm sure they'll do a good job with it. Look, there's going to be a Michigan episode, which I'm going to enjoy. There's going to be an NFL draft episode and showing him sitting there in his house, waiting until the sixth round to get drafted. Uh, there's going to be a deflate gate episode. We'll see if they can shed any more light on that whole deal. They're going to explore his relationship with Belichick. Maybe we could learn something new there. So I'm, I'm sure it'll be it would be good. I don't know if it'll be as great as either the OJ or the last day. Well, I mean, one thing that I did find myself getting angry about was this, this feeling at a, at, that, that Jordan needed to use his sub celebrity and his power and his platform better or differently, uh, you know, whether it was politics or culture or anything like that. I, 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 I thought that was ridiculous. I didn't, I don't remember it at the time. And that's the other thing. What Jordan was, and it was very carefully crafted um, and maintained, and he was very, very smart and understood exactly how he wanted to, uh, to guide his brand, if you will. Uh, you know, the, the, uh, the brand of Tom Brady has, in the same way, been guided along in a very strategic way. And so, and maybe even more so from Tom Brady, I think we in a strange way, even even though even though it was a time where there was less access, I think we knew more about Jordan than we know about Tom Brady, and so the onus is on him to give us more, maybe than uh, than Jordan did. But look, you know, Jordan is about control, and in the end, he had control of this. And uh, and I've played with players, and we all know people that are like this. And they can be the best. They can be great. They can be in, they can be really successful and really important within a team. They can be a pain in the neck. Um, they can be detrimental. And and my point is that this was only one way. And there's a lot of different ways to be the greatest ever. And so if you're sitting at home and saying, "Well, I'm not like that," and so therefore I can't be the best, uh, no, you. You maybe we maybe you can't be like Mike, but that's not necessarily a bad thing, and it doesn't mean that you can't be the greatest ever. So that's that's what I took out of it, and um, maybe it's a little judgmental on me, <laughs> but it wouldn't be the first time. Uh, either way, like I said, I enjoyed it, and I and I continued to watch it and and didn't stop. So it kept my attention, and as an entertainment piece, it certainly did its job. You know, I have to say, both with the Wind of Change, which we talked about last week, and the Last Dance. Your text messages to me during the week made it seem like your opinion was more negative than it was. So I sort of teed you up on, oh, here's, gonna, here's an Alexi, like, you know, firing hot take about how bad this was. It seems like you reserve your, your anger for the Sopranos. But uh, with The Last Dance, you had issues with it. But it's not like a Sopranos level, like... Oh, no, 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 Mossy. It's definitely not. It doesn't <laughs> even come close to reaching the heights of the Sopranos <laughs> bull crap that uh, that that was i don't even start me on the sopranos again why are you riling me up look i i recognize that in the moment in the heat of the moment and i know hot takes are associated with heat but in the heat of the moment i may feel one thing 
And then I may wake up the next day and I might have had a little bit of time to, uh, to, to, let, to let it marinate. And my, and my opinion may, uh, you know, adjust or, or move. Uh, I am, I, listen, I am flexible, Masi. I can, I can, be, I can be convinced. Uh, I can change either on my own or from outside influences. So yeah, look, if you 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 get my texts, and sometimes I'm rolling my eyes, and sometimes I'm, you know, beyond belief that something is happening. But that might that might change going forward. But either way, uh, I'm glad that I'm glad that I watched it. I'm glad that I'm now part of this this club that was a huge huge club and this social experiment, if if you will. Has my view on Jordan changed that much? Not really. I still look at him as the greatest ever. Um, I still loved watching what he did. It was interesting that in a, in a documentary that was so much about who he was, that his family, you know, notwithstanding the situation with his father, which they kind of had to address, but his family, when it came to, when it came to marriage and kids and stuff like that, was almost non-existent. I can't remember a, a real time where that was even a part of it. And obviously that's by design, but had the documentary been done in a more traditional way, or maybe he didn't have the control that he had, maybe that would have been something else. And I'm not saying that there was any problem with it, but you would think a documentary on an individual who was the greatest basketball player ever to play the game would also include that personal aspect of it when it comes to family. Yeah, he had a, uh, I guess, a messy divorce. So his his wife, who was his wife throughout his most of his playing career, was nowhere to be found in the documentary. I don't know what their relationship oh, really? was like wow. these days. Um, but uh, the kids appeared late uh, talking yeah. about the, the 98 final against Utah. So, But yeah, you're right. Not, not a lot of family there. It looked like really, that was so, I, something I really, he wanted to keep really at arm's the, length, you know. Yeah, I really, I really enjoyed the early days, uh, you know, seeing some of the early interviews and some of the early stuff that not just of, uh, of – um, of Michael Jordan, but also of Scottie Pippen playing early and, and, you know, the whole Rodman thing, because I'm a Detroit and maybe that's part of this Mossy is that I'm from Detroit. Okay. And so I think, well, I think the Detroit and Isaiah Thomas were portrayed unfairly, uh, bad boys forever. <laughs> and so, and, and maybe, you know, that's, that's part of the way that I look at it. And it made me happy, you know, watching Bill Lambeer, the whole walking off the court thing, all of that. I mean, it was, it was, I think it was blown out of uh, out of proportion, and the uh, the sanctimony in which Jordan and the Bulls uh, viewed that uh, that act and that moment was uh, pretty rich. Okay. Anyway, uh, anything else, Mossy, on this? No. Just last thing I'll say is, uh, although I, I love the Last Dance, uh, I actually prefer the OJ one. So we're in agreement there. I there thought we go. We're that, in that was a true masterpiece. Well, listen, uh, you know, we have takes out there and uh, some of them are hotter than others. If you have uh, questions, comments, concerns, or rebuttals to anything that I have said, please, please let us know. I'm sure there's plenty of them, uh, uh, plenty of them out there when it comes to what's going on. Uh, we come to the end of yet another podcast. Uh, and at the end of each podcast, we do one for the road. We were recording this on a Sunday. This is Memorial Day weekend, which means that tomorrow on Monday, when you are listening to this, it is Memorial Day. Uh, the day in which we honor and we mourn uh, all of those that have died serving in the armed forces, uh, all of those that have made the ultimate sacrifice for what I believe is the greatest country uh, in the world. And while we shouldn't have a specific day, it should be all days that we appreciate and respect and pay uh, homage and honor uh, to the people that have made the ultimate sacrifice, we do have this day. It'll be a weekend uh, and, and a day when people are out, albeit in a very different type of, uh, uh, of world in which we uh, lived in, but uh, it's still a day. And so I hope everybody does take a moment to, uh, to respect and to honor uh, and to praise all of those. If you are uh, either serving in the military right now, uh, you have my eternal gratitude for keeping us safe uh, and doing what you do for, as I said, the greatest country in the world, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, if you have uh, lost people uh, over the years, um, you have my condolences and my thanks and gratitude for uh, those uh, in your family who have served and, like I said, have kept us safe. Uh, and, and secure and continue to do so. Uh, have a wonderful uh, Memorial Day weekend. Uh, I hope that you are with family. I hope that with your, you are with friends. I hope that you are, like all of us, making do and muddling through. Um, I talked a little earlier about 
perspective. And we all have our moments. I certainly do where we whine and we complain about things. I like to think we all have our moments too, where we think about uh, how good we do have it relative to a lot of people out there in the world. And we are incredibly fortunate and we are uh, oftentimes in the minority and the, and the very small uh, group of people that are privileged to be able to uh, do the things that we do and any type of challenges that we are facing right now, while they may seem big and uh, important um, relative to a lot of people out there, uh, they are small and they would trade places with us in, the, in a second. So I constantly try to remind myself uh, of that. doesn't mean we can't have ups and downs and moments of good and bad. It doesn't mean we can't complain. It doesn't mean we can't uh, whine every, uh, every once in a while, but um, especially in this day and age where everything seems to be heightened, uh, perspective is, uh, is in order. I do believe, as, uh, as we say in each other week, that this too shall pass. You know, we're talking about sports being played. We're talking about uh, some things changing and the possibility of getting back to some sort of normalcy uh, going forward. It's not going to happen overnight. Uh, and it's not necessarily going to happen anytime soon, but there are glimpses, uh, and with those glimpses are hope. So that's not necessarily a story from the past, but that's just what I'm feeling on this Memorial Day weekend uh, of 2020, uh, a year that <laughs> will certainly live in infamy and one that we'll be talking about for a, uh, for a long time. I hope that you are all safe. I hope that you are, are all healthy, and, and I hope that you are all staying sane in these uh, in these interesting times. Mossy, anything before we head out? No, that's it. All right, remember, uh, download and subscribe and rate and review and do all the different things out there on all the uh, podcasting platforms, whether it's Spotify or YouTube uh, or Apple Music uh, or Apple Podcasts or anything else out there when it comes to the State of the Union podcast. We appreciate it and we thank you so much for uh for you know, hanging out with us on a weekly basis. And we hope you'll come back again uh, next week. We will see you again next week. And as always, size the day. You like that clip? Well, my State of the Union podcast drops every week. Subscribe now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts.